Integrated Services Digital Network, or ISDN, allows the digital transmission of voice and data over copper pair. It began in the early 1990s to provide circuit-switched connections for either voice or data in increments of 64 kilobits per second. This session will provide an overview of ISDN fundamentals with an emphasis on ISDN Primary Rate Interface, or PRI. Some basic definitions of ISDN fundamentals will first be provided. Then, the Layer 2 and Layer 3 signaling protocols Q921 and Q931 will be examined, followed by a sample call flow using Q931 messages. We will conclude with a section dedicated to troubleshooting tips. As previously stated, ISDN stands for Integrated Services Digital Network. With ISDN, voice and data are carried by bearer channels, also known as B channels, which occupy a bandwidth of 64 kilobits per second. A data channel, also known as a D channel, handles signaling at 64 kilobits per second, but can also handle signaling at 16 kilobits per second. There are two basic types of ISDN user networks, Basic Rate Interface, also known as BRI, and Primary Rate Interface, also known as PRI. BRI consists of two 64 kilobits per second B channels and one 16 kilobits per second D channel for a total of 144 kilobits per second. This basic service is intended to meet the needs of most individual users. PRI is intended for users with greater capacity requirements. In North America, PRI is deployed over a T1 facility. As shown by this graphic, the channel structure is typically 23 B channels plus one 64 kilobits per second D channel for a total of 1,536 kilobits per second. Non-facility associated signaling, or NFAST, is used to control multiple PRI circuits of up to 479 B channels, along with a single D channel, in order to allocate more bearer channels to handle higher traffic demands. The T1 Extended Super Frame framing structure is typically used in PRI applications. For a single T1 ISDN PRI circuit, the 23B channels are arranged to take the first 23 channels of the T1, and the D channel is at channel 24. Link access protocol on the D channel, also known as LAPD, is the layer 2 protocol used in ISDN. LAPD is almost identical to the X25 LAPB protocol. The purpose of ITUT recommendation Q921 is to provide safe, reliable transport for Q931 or layer 3 signaling messages, to provide identification of frames and to provide flow control mechanisms for data transmission and reception. It supports the terminal equipment identifier, also known as the TEI, and the Service Access Point Identifier, also known as the SAPI, to permit service delivery to multiple terminals. ITUT Recommendation Q931 is a Layer 3 specification used for ISDN that is responsible for call control and management. These functions include call setup, call teardown, and requests for services from Layer 2. Q931 Signaling is a common channel signaling, or CCS service. CCS transmits signaling from end to end and out of band, unlike channel associated signaling, or CAST, which is also used on T1 circuits where signaling information is carried in the signaling bits attached to specific channels. ISDN, BRI, and PRI D channels both use Q931 protocol. There are several Layer 3 protocol variants that meet certain specific needs. 
National ISDN, which was initially defined by Belcor, 5 ESS, which was defined by AT&T, and Nortel's DMS are the three Layer 3 protocols which are used in the United States. This graph shows the ISDN Q921 frame structure. The flag fields, which are on both ends of the Q921 frame, identify the beginning and end of the frame. An active D channel is often identified by checking if rolling frame flags, which are 7E in hexadecimal format or 0111110 in binary format, are on channel 24 of a PRI circuit. The command response bit identifies whether a frame is intended to be a command or a response. The bit value is determined by the direction of the message and the message type. If the user side of the ISDN connection is sending the message, a zero value is used for a command and a one value for a response. The network side sends commands with a bit value of one and a response with a bit value of zero. Q921 uses service access points to provide service to Q931. The access points are denoted with a SAPI to show the higher layer protocol used in the data field. Q931 messages are sent with SAPI 0. X25 messages are sent with SAPI 16, and SAPI 63 is used for terminal endpoint identifier assignment procedures. These are usually the only SAPI values that are used. ATEI identifies the terminal equipment on the data link connection. TEI-127 is for broadcast. TEI values can be dynamically assigned at equipment power-up, or they can be statically assigned from TEI-0 to TEI-63. TEI-0 is often used for PRI. For details on the control bits and the Q921 frame types, refer to the table on the next slide. Three main frame types are used in Q921. The first is a numbered information, or I frame. I frame types are sequence frames with acknowledgments. They are standard transmission and reception frames that transport messages, such as Q931 setup messages. The second type is the unnumbered information, or U-frame, which is used to facilitate connection management. The main difference between I and U-frames is that U-frames do not guarantee delivery and they do not require acknowledgments. The third main frame type is a supervisory, or S-frame, which displays different layer control states. One such state is receive ready which denotes that the ISDN device can begin to receive frames. Another is receive not ready, which indicates that transmission should not take place yet. There is also the reject state, which is used to request the retransmission of a frame that was corrupted. Although it is not one of the main frame types, another Q921 frame is a set asynchronous balanced mode, or SABME frame which is the first message sent during a layer 2 connection sequence. The unnumbered acknowledgement, or UA frame, responds to the SABME frame to acknowledge receipt of the connection request. After multiple frames have been established, the disconnect frame can be sent to disconnect the link. If multiple frames cannot be established, the disconnected mode frame is sent instead. If the frames cannot be recovered through retransmission, the frame reject message will report the errors. This is the layer 2 establishment process. As this chart shows, the TE sends a SABME frame with a SAPI of 0 for call control and for setup initiation, and a TEI of the value previously assigned by the network. In this example, the value of the TEI is 0. Next, the NT responds with a UA frame with a SAPI of 0 and the previously assigned TEI to acknowledge the receipt of the connection request.
The TE indicates that it can begin receiving frames by sending a receive ready frame. At this point, layer 2 connection has been established and it is ready to offer service to the upper layer, that is, layer 3 setup. The TE then sends an iframe with a SAPI of 0 and the previously assigned TEI to transport the Q931 setup message. NS and NR show that no frames have been received yet. The NT responds with an iframe with the same SAPI and TEI to acknowledge the Q931 setup message. NR also acknowledges that one frame was previously received by the NT. The TE sends a receive ready frame to indicate that it can begin receiving frames. To disconnect after multiple frames have been established, the disconnect frame can be sent. However, as previously discussed, if multiple frames cannot be established, the disconnected mode frame is sent. And if frames cannot be recovered by retransmission, the frame reject message will be sent. Using the D channel, the TE and the NT exchange messages to control the call functions of the ISDN circuits, including setup, teardown, and request for services from layer 2. Q931 signaling is a common channel signaling service. The details of the message fields that are shown in this chart will be provided next. In a Q931 message field, the protocol discriminator identifies the user network call control message types from other message types that might be found on the network. The length of call reference octet specifies how many octets the call reference value can encompass. It is considered a part of the actual call reference, which is used to maintain a record of all call requests that are processed. For PRI, the call reference is at least three octets long. A flag in the call reference field delineates the originating and terminating sides of a connection. A message sent from the origination point will have a flag set to zero. If the flag is set to one, the message is sent from the terminating side of the connection. Bits one through five in the message field identify the actual message, while the last three bits identify the message class. For a complete list of call messages and values, refer to the ITU standard. The message type defines the purpose of the frame. Although the ITU standard should be consulted for a complete list of call messages and values, here is the list of the most common ones. The setup message is the first message sent to initiate the call. The call proceeding message is sent to the calling party to indicate that the call establishment is proceeding. The alerting message causes the phone to ring on the receiving side, making the called party aware of the incoming call. The connect message indicates that the called party has accepted the call. The caller responds with a connection acknowledge message. To end the call, one of the parties sends a disconnect message. It can also be sent by the network to clear the call. The release message indicates that the channel has been cleared. The recipient of the release message then sends a release complete message. This is an example of ISDN call setup and teardown using Q931 messages. The setup message originates from the calling party and is sent to the called party. The called party's phone rings after receiving this setup message and the ISDN switch sends a call proceeding message. An alerting message travels through the ISDN switch, causing a ring back tone to be sent to the called party to alert it of the incoming call. When the called party answers the call, a connect message is sent. Though a connect acknowledge message can be sent from the calling party to the called party in return, this message type is generally sent from the network to the called party. An ongoing connection has now been established. In this example, the calling party also ends the connection. A disconnect message travels to the called party, and the network then sends a release message to the calling party. After receiving this message, 
The calling party sends back a release completes message to the network. The called party sends a release message to the ISDN switch, which then sends back a release completes message. The call has been cleared on both sides, and both the calling and the called parties are disconnected. Q931 messages also contain an information elements field, which can comprise many different IEs that describe the capabilities and features of a call. The setup message alone contains more than 15 different IEs. The most important IEs, however, are bearer capability, channel identification, and the called and calling party numbers. The bearer capability information element indicates the type of B channel requested, showing what services the call is capable of providing. The channel identification IE indicates which channel will be used for bearer service. During the call setup, it is also possible to send multiple channels in order to provide a selection of channels. The called and calling party numbers information elements specify the originating and destination numbers associated with the call. These particular IEs can have a variety of formats, as we will see next. The number field type will describe what kind of number it is. There are seven different types of number fields. They are unknown, international, national, network specific, subscriber, abbreviated, and reserved. The numbering plan identification field shows what type of numbering plan is being used for the ISDN number. The most common numbering plan is E164. The most common practice in ISDN circuit testing is making outbound calls and receiving inbound calls. Verify the calling party name and verify that the calling party number is delivered with the correct number of digits as provisioned. SIP to ISDN PRI conversion is performed at the Integrated Access Device, or IAD. This conversion introduces process delay and can easily cause significant echo impairment. Therefore, check for noticeable echoing when testing a voice call. For voice over digital cable network, voice traffic is prioritized when sent over the IP network to ensure quality of service. The CMTS, cable modems, and the IAD also each play an important role in handling the prioritized traffic. Voice quality can be impaired if the prioritized voice traffic is not handled properly. The D channel handles all the signaling of an ISDN circuit. The D channel status is the first step to checking for any problems relating to call failures. Verify that the D channel is active on the configured signaling channel, which is normally channel 24. If outgoing calls cannot go through, check if a 10 digit or an 11 digit phone number for national calls is supposed to be used. The cause code available in the disconnect and release D channel messages provides a reason for terminating a call, which is helpful in troubleshooting a call connection failure. In this training, we have learned about the fundamentals of ISDN. We have seen the two basic types of ISDN service, basic rate interface, which is meant to meet the needs of most individual users, and primary rate interface, which is meant for those with greater capacity needs. We also learned about the signaling protocol of Q921, and we looked at the three main types of Q921 frames, which are numbered information, unnumbered information, and supervisory, as well as the layer 2 establishment process. We also learned about the signaling protocol of Q931. Next, we looked at a sample ISDN call flow using Q931 messages, and we learned about the information elements in those messages. Finally, we learned about testing and troubleshooting calls. For more information, Contact VX at 510-651-0500 or on our website at www.vxinc.com.